Welcome back to our Get Data Protection Fit series for 2023. I'm Kate Partridge, a director in our Field Fisher Data team, and I'm co-presenting today with my colleagues Natalie Barnfield, a fellow director, and Sophia Steiger, an associate, both from our data team. Thank you for joining us in the third year of our Get Data Protection Fit series. Today, we will be presenting on the Data Reform Bill in 20 minutes. Today's session is the last module of this series. This series has largely focused on international data transfers, and we hope you have found these useful. In today's session, we digress slightly to give you an overview of the Data Reform Bill. By the end of this session, you should be better able to explain the Data Protection and Digital Information Bill and where it is on the legislative journey, key changes proposed under the bill, if the UK's adequacy status is likely to change, and what has been said about the bill. I'll now hand you over to Sophia to go into further detail on the Data Reform Bill. So what is the Data Reform Bill? The full title is the Data Protection and Digital Information No. 2 Bill, and it contains proposed reforms to the UK GDPR, the Data Protection Act, the Freedom of Information Act, and the Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations. The bill aims to move from the one-size-fits-all approach of the EU GDPR, whilst ensuring that the new regime is built on the UK's high standards for data protection and privacy. The government expects the reforms proposed in the bill to unlock £4.7 billion in saving for the UK economy over the next 10 years, to introduce a simple, clear and business-friendly framework, to support international data sharing and to remove unnecessary paperwork. The ICO has described the bill as an important milestone in the evolution of the UK's data protection regime. The bill has had a bit of a stop-start journey to get to this stage. It was first introduced as the Data Protection and Digital Information Bill in July 2022, but after the second reading scheduled for September 22 was cancelled in the wake of Liz Truss being appointed as Prime Minister, the bill was put on pause. Since then, the government engaged in further consultation with the ICO, industry leaders, consumer groups such as WHICH, and different business groups. And then, on 8th of March 2023, the revised Data Protection and Digital Information No. 2 Bill was introduced to Parliament. It has since had its first and second readings in the House of Commons. It was the subject of multiple committee debates through May, and we are now waiting for the report stage date to be announced. It will then face its third reading and can then start its journey onwards to the House of Lords. So is it likely to change any further as it moves through the domestic legislative process? It is worth noting that the Data Protection Act 2018 was the last data protection law to go through the same process and was the most amended piece of legislation in that session. However, the UK Department for Science, Information and Technology does not expect any major changes, but rather that the bill will pass through in a similar form. Let's have a look at some of the changes proposed under the bill. The identifiable living individual, currently the identifiable natural person under GDPR, is redefined, a nuanced change that could lead to some data not falling under UK data protection law. Two cases are given. Firstly, when the living individual is identifiable by the controller or processor by reasonable means at the time of processing. And secondly, where the controller or processor knows or ought reasonably to know that another person who will obtain the data through processing will be able to identify the living individual by reasonable means. The definition of scientific research is expanded to include research for the purposes of commercial activity. The concept of consent is also amended so that if researchers want to reuse data for further purposes not originally anticipated, they do not need to provide a privacy note to individuals when this data was not collected directly from those individuals. There have been two changes to legitimate interests. The bill creates a concept of recognised legitimate interests and inserts an annex to provide a non-exhaustive list of examples, such as when the processing is necessary for safeguarding natural national security or responding to an emergency. A documented balancing test against individual rights is not required for those limited purposes. And then also to provide greater clarity for controllers, the bill inserts examples of what processing could be deemed as necessary for the purpose of legitimate interest. The three examples are processing for the purposes of direct marketing, 
for ensuring security of network and information systems and for intragroup transmission of personal data for internal administrative purposes. Further guidance is provided for the concept of purpose limitation, such as an annex that lists purposes that would be seen as compatible with the original purpose. However, if the original collection of personal data was based on consent, further processing requires new consent unless a limited derogation applies or the controller cannot reasonably be expected to obtain consent. And just to look at some further changes that are being proposed under the bill. The first is um, in relation to data subject access requests. So many of you will already know that under the current regime, controllers have the ability to refuse or to charge reasonable fees for data subject access requests that are manifestly unfounded or excessive. Now the bill proposes to amend this threshold, if you like, um, for refusing and charging fees if the request is vexatious or excessive. So it essentially changes the concept of manifestly unfounded to vexatious. Um, and it also gives, you some, gives us some examples of what it would consider to be vexatious requests. And it includes those that are intended to cause distress, that are not made in good faith, um, or that are an abuse of, proce of, of process. Now, there's been some commentary to suggest that this change should actually widen the ability for, contr for controllers to refuse um, or to charge fees for data subject access requests. But if you look at the way that the ICO currently interprets this concept of manifestly unfounded and how that aligns um, and how closely that aligns with the examples that are provided in the bill of what it constitutes a vexatious request, um, it's quite difficult to see how these proposed changes are going to significantly change the status quo. Secondly, there are some changes on automated decision making. So um, the bill now prohibits automated decision making, i.e. Uh, decision making without any meaningful human involvement, which produces which produce legal or similarly significant effects that are based solely on or partly on special category data. That is, unless you have some sort of exemption such as consent um, uh, unless it's necessary for the performance of a contract or for the entry into a contract or if it's required by law. Um, in addition, the bill also specifies that additional safeguards are required where a significant decision is made um, based on just generic processing of personal data by automated processing. So there's some additional safeguard requirements. Thirdly, the bill now scraps the requirement for controllers and processes that are not established in the UK, but are nonetheless caught by the territorial scope of the UK GDPR to appoint a UK representative. So that requirement is now scrapped um, and some red tape um, gladly removed. Um, changes to the um, requirements to appoint a DPO. Now, the bill actually scraps the requirement to appoint a data protection officer, sounds positive, but replaces it um, with a requirement for controllers and processes that are carrying out high risk processing to appoint what's now known as a senior responsible individual. And that's um, someone that has to be part of senior management and that essentially has oversight of data protection compliance within the organisation. Now, at present, there isn't any guidance as to what constitutes high risk processing that would trigger the, the need to appoint a senior responsible individual. Um, but interestingly, the tasks and roles that the senior responsible, responsible individual has under the bill look very similar to those that um, a DPO would have under the GDPR. So this looks like somewhat of um, a change of name, if you like, of the role of the, the DPO, uh, but not a change in substance of um, the, the, the scope of the role, albeit there is now um, a higher threshold for having to appoint a senior responsible individual only if you're carrying out high risk processing. The bill also proposes to scrap the requirement to maintain records of processing activities or Article 30 records. Um, except for those controllers or processes that are carrying out high risk processing activities, although um, we're still yet to have clarity as to what will constitute high risk processing activities. There are also changes being proposed to transfers of personal data out of the UK. Um, they will be pleased to hear that the bill does provide that much needed assurance that 
transfer mechanisms that are relied on prior to the bill coming into effect will continue to be valid. Um, but it does introduce a new threshold for determining adequacy of third countries um, for the purposes of transfers of data out of the UK. And it's newly sort of named the data protection test. Um, and that test is going to essentially determine whether a jurisdiction or a third country offers protections that are materially lower than exist under the UK GDPR. So it's a slightly different test to, um, to that which exists under the EU GDPR. There's also some changes um, being proposed to the ICO um, in structure, strategy and oversight. So first, um, the ICO will be replaced with a corporate body, which will be called the Information Commission. And there's um, some kind of guidance on the strategy of the Information Commission in that it has to consider the promotion of economic growth and the impact of competition um, in the exercise of its duties. There's also a requirement that the Secretary of State must now approve any statutory guidance that's issued by the ICO, so sort of um, any codes of practice that will have statutory footing before it's laid to Parliament and laid before Parliament. And there is some suggestion that this might lead to some more, some more pragmatism in some of that statutory guidance. So some of these proposed changes to um, the ICO have actually prompted concern, particularly amongst um, the likes of civil society groups um, about the ongoing independence of the regulator. Though, you know, the current Information Commissioner, John Edwards, has certainly emphasised that even as amended, the bill will maintain the ICO's regulatory, regulatory independence, but um, that, I suppose, remains to be seen. There are also some changes introduced by the bill to PECA or um, the PEC regs or Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations. So this is the UK's um, implementation of the European e-privacy directive. It's um, a separate piece of legislation to the UK GDPR, but sits alongside it and complements it um, and covers a range of subject matters from uh, direct marketing through to the use of cookies. Now, in terms of changes that are being proposed to PECA, um, there are changes to the exemptions uh, to the, the requirement to obtain consent to the use of cookies. Well, um, it's actually the requirement to obtain consent for the storage or access to information from um, a user device. So it's actually more applies more broadly just to the um, than just to the use of cookies. Um, and it actually permits additional uh, it permits storage or access to information from user devices for additional purposes, um, including, you know, for service improvement purposes, um, se although seemingly only on a first party basis uh, to ensure the security of um, ensure the security of a service or, you know, to push out security patches and for the likes of emergency assistance, just just by way of example. So to, to locate a device or a particular individual in an, in an emergency scenario. There is also some changes to direct marketing rules in that um, the bill proposes to expand the current soft opt in exemption to um, the direct marketing consent requirement to charities and non commercial organisations and political parties. And then finally, um, the ICO's enforcement powers under PECA um, will be brought into line with its powers of enforcement under the UK GDPR. So, um, i.e. The, the kind of, um, the, the ICO has the ability to fine up to 17.5 million pounds or 4% of worldwide turnover, um, which is much, much greater than the previous penalty cap of 500,000 pounds that previously existed or currently exists under um, the PEC regs. One of the main concerns has been whether or not the Data Reform Bill will impact the UK's adequacy status with the EU. Many of us will remember with great relief the EU Commission's adequacy decision for the UK, which was released in June 2021. Businesses before this time were concerned um, about their ability to transfer data in and out of the UK before this decision even though at that stage the UK GDPR was a direct copy and paste of the EU GDPR. This adequacy decision is expected to last until the 27th of June 2025. However, 
it can be ended sooner. So, does the Data Reform Bill threaten the UK's adequacy status? If you ask people in the UK, the answer is likely to be no. Julia Lopez, previously the Minister of State for the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, confirmed that the government believes that we will maintain adequacy with the passage of this bill, detailing that the UK was in constant contact with the Commission when drafting the bill. In his response to the bill being reintroduced after its amendments, John Edwards, the Information Commissioner, have stated that in my view, the proposed changes in the bill strike a positive balance and should not present a risk to the UK's adequacy status. Now that said, that is not the view of everyone. People versus Big Tech, an open network of civil society organisations and concerned citizens, just as recently as the 3rd of July, have published an open letter to the EU Commission regarding the UK's data reform bill. They consider it to be a dangerous bill that threatens every EU citizen. In their view, the bill will allow the state and corporations to circumvent EU rules and it flies in the face of the 2021 UK adequacy decision. They also believe that the bill will give the UK government the power to override data protection principles whenever it sees fit. They are asking the Commission to stand ready to adopt immediate acts to appeal the adequacy decision. So, whilst we certainly hope the UK adequacy decision will not be affected, it certainly could be a watch this space if there's sufficient political appetite. In terms of what is being said about the bill, there are mixed responses. There have been a lot of promises to reduce red tape but when you look at the substantive nature of the provision, we're not sure how radical it is going to be in practice. The UK government and ICO are coming out in support of the amended bill. The Information Commissioner himself stated, I welcome the DPDI bill as a positive package of reforms that allow us to continue to operate as a trusted, fair and independent regulator. The bill protects people's rights and freedoms, whilst also providing greater regulatory certainty for organisations and promoting growth and innovation in the UK economy. The ICO's response wasn't all glowing, however, as they have noted several areas that could be improved with further clarity, in particular on the topic of anonymisation when considering safeguards for processing for research purposes. On the other hand, 27, 26 civil society organisations, including Liberty Privacy International and Open Rights Group, wrote to Michelle Donnellan asking for the bill to be dropped due to four key concerns. Firstly, the weakening of data subject rights and corporate accountability mechanisms, the reduction of the independence of the ICO, the expansion of data processing and the Secretary of State's discretion to improve international data transfers to countries with insufficient data protection standards. The letter raised concerns that the bill could create new opportunities for discrimination against vulnerable groups and lower personal data protection, despite public support for more robust regulation of data-driven technologies. So going forward, the UK is likely to have a different data protection regime, but it's unlikely that there's actually going to be such a significant regime change to really make any significant impact on businesses. I think for multinational businesses, what they're going to experience is a set of two regime requirements, which goes against the goal of reducing red tape. And many practitioners and privacy professionals are seeing this bill as just one more thing to consider and any real perceived benefits might really only be felt by organisations that have a pure UK customer base. Thank you for listening to our presentation today. We hope by the end of this session you should now be better able to explain the Data Protection and Digital Information Bill and where it is in its legislative journey, 
key changes proposed under the bill, views on whether the UK's adequacy status is likely to change, and what has been said about the bill. If you're interested in learning more about data and privacy, do have a look on our YouTube channel. We host a variety of content. Coming up in the next half of the year, keep an eye out for our content on generative AI, a very interesting and complex topic from a privacy perspective. We have some relevant links here on the slide if you're interested in signing up to our YouTube channel or if you would like to sign up to our team's email digest. Again, thank you on behalf of myself, Natalie and Sophia for taking the time to listen to our session today, the Data Reform Bill in 20 minutes. Do get in touch if you have any questions and bye for now.